it just spontaneously kind of wanted to try it again. Maybe a chord, I don't know. Maybe just uh, be careful about the chord. <clears throat> Um, okay, so um, today I'll, I just uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, work I've been doing recently, really looking at the, um, the trips logical form and uh, and especially its comparison to AMR and, and what the uh, um, differences and similarities are, and uh, and and actually I also am very interested in the kind of different uh, strategies for moving forward on trying to build deep semantic parsers. Um, <clears throat> uh, on the face of it, uh, the reason I was interested in it is on the face of it, AMR and, and the TRIPS logical form look very similar. Um, and they are at the, sort of at the notational level. Um, but as you look deeper, you um, you find some pretty significant differences. So, <clears throat> But first, here's the TRIPS logical form. Um, the idea of the logical form is really something, it's essentially a context-independent meaning of a sentence. Or you might kind of think of it as a semantic parse tree in kind of parallel to a syntactic parse tree. Um, and so the nodes are semantic objects and they're linked by semantic relations um, rather than syntactic objects and, 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 and distinctions. So that's one way to look at it. Yeah, there is something wrong with this connection. Just maybe if I put this right here. Okay. Um, this is kind of highlighted. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's uh, taking. Uh, okay. So let's go back. Um, another way to look at it on the trips logical form is it really is that uh, by its definition it's a starting point for contextual and discourse interpretation and so we want this to be the input to things like reference resolution how do what do uh, noun phrases what are they referring to um, ellipsis resolution we get fragments in how can we fill out the details that was that sort of assumed um, from the current discourse context uh, conventional speech act analysis what kind of what does a person trying to convey um, by what they just said. Um, and do more generally, intention recognition. How do we, it's kind of a starting point for, how do we figure out what the speaker in, in a dialogue situation, the speaker is in trying to do by what they said. Um, so it's kind of providing uh, that input. It's, the idea is that it provides almost all the, inf all the information you need to do these processes. You, so you don't have to look back at syntax. That's not quite true for a, a, like a lepsis resolution, things like that. So you, you might want to do a little bit of syntax there. But uh, um, for the most part, that's what the goal is. Um, and um, we then, then the, the other thing it is, is it's essentially an interface to applications. And we built a wide range of different applications using exactly the same parser um, from things in uh, text understanding, where we actually use ontology-based extraction to do things like we're currently doing, understanding content of biology papers. Um, I talked about that a few weeks ago, as that's part of that process there. Um, we've also done extracting timelines from patient histories and medical records, or just generally extracting events and temporal relations out of arbitrary text, um, as in like the temporal evaluations and things like that. Um, so those are really just structural mapping, matching on the logical form to do those tasks. Um, dialogue systems, are, it's, it's more the input into much deeper reasoning, and we have systems, uh, for instance, texting with, their, with teens about their asthma, um, which is an ongoing project with the nursing school, um, learning tasks in web browsers, a file system we built a few years ago, interactive planning, human-robot communication, uh, coordination, communication, those are all other applications um, that we're also using this output for. And then finally, there's a, a bunch of work we've done recently on learning by reading. So reading definitions to build uh, common sense theories of what words mean and, and put them together and, and so we can reason about word meaning. 
um, and also uh, also related to what I talked about a few weeks ago, actually trying to build biological models that are described by a biology research paper. So you've got to take whole paragraphs or sections of a paper and, and come up and say, this is the causal model they're describing. Um, um, so those are the kind of, uh, so, so the logical form sort of wants, needs to feed enough information in to, in, in some sense, enable all these kind of tasks. Um, so that's where, that's the motivation for the TRIPS logical form. Um, AMR uh, is uh, the abstract meaning representation, and they, basically, the goal here is, is a semantic tree bank based on prop bank. That's what they describe it as. Um, so prop banks and the existing resource that goes through a fairly comprehensive uh, listing of different verbs and the structure of those verbs and what roles they take and uh, other, other aspects like that. Um, and the, the goal here is actually, um, their argument, which is a very good one, is um, look what happened to uh, parsing um, once we started having uh, tree banks, right? There's this whole kind of explosion of uh, um, statistical parsers that were uh, enabled by this corpus. Um, and, uh, and we've seen, you know, uh, great advances in, in kind of ability to do syntactic parsing because of this. And uh, they would like to see and uh, kind of enable the exact same um, explosion of work and progress in semantic parsing. Um, and so they want to build a tree bank. Um, so they're building its manual annotation and they build something like this graph structure for something like the boy wants to go. And we'll go into more about what it is um, there. They're a little vaguer on exactly what the, the intended applications are. The one that's generally mentioned is that, well, if we can get semantic representations, we should, we hopefully can improve machine translation. And I don't know, Dan, has, has, has there been actual, anything demonstrated on this yet? Yeah, I know you've been involved in this. Yeah. But anyway, that's one of, that's one of the key goals there. And uh, um, so that's a semantic representation of maybe we can get better machine translation out of it. Um, there's not a lot of discussion about other, other particular applications. Um, and uh, as we'll see later on, I think, you know, if, we're, if they're really going to support a wide range of applications, we definitely need to get to a AMR 2.0, because um, there's some significant gaps in, in uh, the information they, can encode, they, they are encoding. Um, <clears throat> but. So how do you connect that with the representation of uh, I guess the context of you know the boy and like maybe it's just a three year old at home. You know, if the boy wants to go, you know, like imply something about the boy needs to go to the bathroom as opposed to like, they're they're not talking about they're not thinking about that. So um, I mean, does that in matter? fact in fact uh, what they're mainly in fact you notice boy here is not even they don't even know actually maybe boy is not well I'm sure word net has multiple senses of boy. Right. They don't even, they're not even attempting to identify what sense of boy this is here. Okay. They do it to get the word sense of the verbs, they identify the senses that are in this existing resource prop bank. Okay. And the roles for those roles, like R0, R1, are defined for this verb. And so they're, they're coming down and doing that. And of course, this verb over here, go, also has a sense. And the main point, they often start their talks with this diagram because they want to point out, which is absolutely true, that when you're looking at semantics, um, you have, uh, it's not just a straight uh, um, tree-like structure, in fact, you want to do this sort of, uh, you know, this, the subject of want here is the subject of go. And so that's why we have these two arrows pointing to the same object here, which is the instance of boy. Um, so that's why this, they use this, this figure a lot in, 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 as an introductory diagram <clears throat> to try and distinguish it, for, say, from a sy syntactic tree. Um, damn. I must, I must just <laughs> touch the computer. Okay. So, so those are the representations. Um, uh, let's see, I think there's one more page of uh, uh, principles here. Going back to the logical form, you can actually kind of see where some of these differences come from. Uh, uh, as we go along based on um, these principles, which are the ones that we used in defining the logical form. 
Um, so uh, providing a representation of sentence meaning that is context independent, um, that's mostly shared uh, between the two projects. Um, they both have that goal. Um, compositionally derived from syntax, that's one of our goals of our logical form. It's explicitly not a goal of AMR. They, they don't want to constrain uh, the logical representation to uh, how the, it was realized in a sentence. Um, and one of the goal, reasons for that is they want AMR to capture essentially kind of paraphrases in a single representation. So there may be multiple different ways of saying something and they all collapse to the same AMR representation. And we'll see some examples of that later. Um, I'm just wondering what, what is the intended meaning of context independent in this context? I mean, because um, it, it seems that preliminary interpretations of, um, you know, of any variety that I've seen, I mean, they're always highly context dependent in the sense that they need to be decontextualized. They need to be, uh, you need to say, at what time was this uttered? Yes, uh, right, who was right. being addressed? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are you know, the uh, pronouns referring to? Mm -hmm. what is, right. You know, all of that stuff. Uh, yeah. Which makes it highly context dependent. <laughs> well, no, but the represent these representations don't do that. Okay, there's no, no. The, like the, and the referent or the reference of pronouns or something is not in this logical form, right? It just records this as a pronoun. Now, an AMR, right, which to me makes it highly context dependent. I'm just, you know, I'm, no, just I'm not. Uh, not sorry, no, what that. I mean is the your, and it's not quite true, right? but it means that you derive this thing independent of context. So you don't look at it, it's like you give a person, it's like they're often done in psychological experiments, right? You give a person a sentence and you ask them questions about it. They have no idea um, what the surrounding sentences are, who's talking or whatever like that. What do they come up with? Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of idea. And yeah. all the things that you said, yeah, right, are, which are obvious. The idea here is, I mean, yeah, we're getting, uh, the way I view it, right, is essentially the logical form in some, in the way that you're probably talking about it, it's sort of an abstract function now mm -hmm. that'll take the current context exactly. and map it to the new context. Exactly. And it's sort of a, a you know, a compositional function that does that mapping. Mm -hmm. and that's the way I view it. Um, but, you know, that means we, but we don't want to insert contextual information, you know, that, that you know, we're trying to not have to look at the context in order mm -hmm. to build mm -hmm. the logical form. Now, you can argue, I thought you were going to say, well, you know, you're doing word sense disambiguation. Surely you have to uh, use context to do that, and that's sort of true. Um, so it's a fuzzy area. Um, well, it's kind of a, sort of an inversion right. of, of how one might understand context independence. Right, right, right. <laughs> that you've got something that no right. longer uh, right. meets the context to right, have right. A Okay, yeah, right. So you could, that, you're right. Depending on how you read it, you could say yeah. this is a context dependent. Yeah. That's how I think of it. Yes, right. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> what I mean is we derive it independent of context, yeah. primarily of the syntax and mm -hmm. the lexical structure and whatever, the generic <laughs> ontology of language, nothing to do with the current situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. Um, um, we retain uh, scoping and referential ambiguity um, uh, because that all requires a contextual disambiguation. Um, Again, that is not a uh, aim of AMR. In fact, they don't encode uh, um, uh, quantifiers and things like that, as we'll see. In the so then, after the next point, um, we got richly expressive. We're trying to express all the relevant semantic information. Um, uh, I'm sure Len can point out a, a long list of things that we don't actually quite capture. So you know, we do only go so far, and then we say, well, okay, that's where. We're, we, we compromise at some stage, but we're trying to be broadly expressive. Um, and critically, it should be, a, the logical form should be a gateway into the backward, background knowledge representation, especially that there's essentially a shared ontology. We can actually start reasoning from logical form and connect it into our common sense knowledge. Those are sort of the goals. Um, okay, so now let's get to notation. Um, so here's the AMR logical form of a boy wants to go, and here's the trips logical form. Um, so we can just move it out of the way. Essentially, you can see these are essentially uh, basically identical graphs, with the one exception here that uh, AMR separates out the connection between an instance 
to the type with an explicit arc, and we encode the type in the label on the node. Okay, so, um, and of course, actually, as you notice, we are actually disambiguating all the words. So boy, as we know, is a, a subclass of child, um, and go is a subclass of moving, and things like that. Um, and we also, as we will go through all these differences before, we have different labels on the arts than they do. But the point is here that, oops, I went backwards. Point is here that at least from a graphical representation, we have essentially syntactically equivalent representations. And that is true. Um, and we'll see, we'll see a few minor variations as they go along, but nothing of any consequence. Um, there's also a term-based notation uh, in uh, uh, AMR and the equivalent term-based notation in, in the trips. This is, in fact, the original um, uh, logical form uh, notation in trips, which we still use mostly for systems because it's more convenient for systems for programs to run over because um, we only developed the graphical representation in 2007. <coughs> um, but, uh, um, as we see, we basically have, except for the fact that we flatten out terms rather than embed them, um, again, we have this identical representation. So we have, you know, variable there, type want. Here we have our variable here, type want. We have the roles mar uh, matching to other objects. We have our roles matching to other objects. Um, they embed their semantic restrictions in there. We pull them out. And where's boy? Uh, over here. So we pull them out uh, um, and flatten them out. But again, they're essentially equivalent. It's a trivial program to write that would translate one to the other here. Um, uh, except, I mean, it's obviously, we've got, as we'll see, we've got more information in, in ours, but essentially the notation is, is, a, is a identical. Um, to get to inverse arcs, and uh, uh, here's just a more complicated example just showing the parallels. Uh, here's a, well, I didn't, oh, here it is. A girl who was seen by the boy wants him. So another one of their examples that so we have the uh, wanting. This is a girl. Uh, this was seen by the boy. And you notice actually the linking here, they've got inverse arcs here. So this is basically saying that the girl is, uh, you know, basically saying there's an arc one arc going this way from seeing the girl. Um, but because of the way it's presented in the graph here, um, they have inverse arcs. Um, we don't have inverse arcs. We actually um, express it in a, uh, using a relational uh, dependency that essentially points from this node to the modification. And then we have the, this is the predicate, seeing predicate, and we have the actual arguments going back. But again, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a slight notational variant. That, um, uh, no significant difference. Um, there is a difference here, though. <laughs> so here we have um, the girl who was seen by the boy wants him. Uh, their annotation says, okay, the, uh, they've resolved the him to be the boy. And so they have this as, that is in, in, uh, in the annotator's estimation, the correct uh, reading of the sentence. Um, Trips, in its effort to stay uh, either independent or dependent, depending on how you read it, of context, says, I can't do pronoun resolution right now. Okay, I don't know whether this him is the boy or someone else we were just talking about, which is true. They're both possible interpretations. Um, and that's for, uh, you know, contextual dis uh, interpretation to, to disambiguate. And so we leave the pronoun forms exactly like that, uh, as they were, just recording this pronoun um, and him. And, uh, and the boy is over here as a, um, and when you get to reference resolution, this will be a possible antecedent, obviously, that you could resolve that too. Yes? Is there any, would there be something that incorporating the spells to the, at any point where this ambiguation would be required to come into the Well, in, in some sense, this is a stub, right? And in some sense, you, you're, um, this is going to be replaced. Um, in the context of this ambiguation, this is going to point to something, and we're going to replace it with the thing we're pointing at. So that's a, so it is very much like that. Yeah. 
Um, uh, neutral and neutral one. We'll have to go and look at the rules later. The semantic roles, one of the big differences here is the semantic role system. And the semantic roles in trips are defined uh, independently of the verbs and with specific meanings. And according to the criteria we define, both of these are actually um, uh, nu neutral. Uh, what neutral means is it's an object involved in, in an event that is not being changed by the event and is not causing the event. Um, so it's like sort of a, um, pulling out the kind of typical agent roles and typical patient roles. Um, what you have mostly left are these things like that. But this is that's a one on the end here just to distinguish them, but they allow essentially, they fill the same, same semantic uh, relationship to the um, verb. And I'll, I'll look at the, role, the roles, we'll, we'll look at them a little bit in a minute. Um, so as you can see, AMR is, is trying to do a little bit of contextual interpretation. Now presumably, the, it's the annotator did this by looking at the context of the sentence and deciding that yes, him really did refer to the boy. Because there's nothing in the structure of the sentence itself that requires this. Um, and so that is a difference there. AMR is doing some context dependent. When they're coding the sentence, they're looking at the context of the sentence. Is this an actual sentence taken from a corpus? Because it this looks, is from, it this looks, is. It looks made up. They probably, made, this is from their, they have an extensive manual on stuff. And so I took examples out yeah. of that to, to just to, uh, because first they, they're just, you know, they build them in order to illustrate points. Right. So they were, it was so a good source. The probably didn't have further context. You probably, you're right, yeah, right. But they wanted to have an example where they show that you actually are doing some reference resolution in the, in the, in the AMR representation. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I bet you're right. This, uh, although they did, the first thing they annotated was what, it's something like the Little Prince or something like that, some book. And there's a lot of fanciful language in there. Uh, probably not this one, but um, it's, it's uh, some. Then what? Yeah, they made it up, <laughs> and they know what context they wanted to be he true. What he's thinking of. <laughs> right, right, exactly. One question: I'm wondering, yeah. why do you think they were thinking about doing co-reference resolution, but not sense dissimulation? Basically, why do oh, they think they should have this, but not? Sense I think uh, AM. I think the, the answer is they really wanted to get the project off the ground. It's it's a it's a really huge effort to try and define a comprehensive. Uh, uh, first logical form language, and then if you have to do all the sense disambiguation, you then have to have a sense taxonomy, and that's been studied extensively for verbs, right? So we have, you know, prop bang, we have, you know, onto notes, we have all sorts of stuff where people have looked at verb senses and tried to come up with an ontology of verb senses. Um, there isn't the equivalent for nouns, um, although actually word net's not a bad ontology for nouns. Um, and it's nothing for adjectives or adverbs or other things like that, basically. And so, you know, if they had waited around to get all the senses, they would, they'd still be trying to, you know, they wouldn't have annotated a sentence yet. So I think some of it is, you know, what can we, what can we get off the ground fast? And that's, that's one of the goals. Um, Okay, so here's an example. Uh, this is actually from one of their, their talk in uh, at one of the big mechanisms. They're actually encoding biology papers. And so this is an example from, uh, that they gave at that talk. Um, <clears throat> sorry for the long biological words again, but actually if you don't want to know anything about biology, phosphorylation is one of the most critical concepts, okay? We would all be dead in a second without phosphorylation. It's so basically, oh, it's one of the prime ways in which our, our body chemistry controls itself, right? Our, the body is a whole set of control processes, and you have to keep switching on and off different capabilities. And a lot of it's done by attaching a phosphate molecule to, to uh, an existing protein or pulling it off. That's kind of a switch, you're turning them on. So it turns up all over the place. But here's a set of paraphrases. Um, so this is ERK, which is a protein, and BRAF is another protein. So ERK phosphorylated BRAF, that's a verb sentence. Um, here's a passive version of it. Um, but here are normalizations of it, the phosphorylation, phosphorylation of BRAF by ERK, 
or Bert BRAF uh, phosphorylation. Um, these are all different ways of essentially evoking the same event. Okay, and so they are they use this example and say, okay, we're coding it this way. So there's a phosphorylate action, and in each one of these, the R1 is the uh, enzyme BRAF. Actually, they're proteins, but um, and uh, the other one, R2, is uh, ERK. They got a lot of grief for this at the meeting, saying, well, surely ERK was the agent here. Um, and they said, no, because that would be someone going off and doing something and making it possible. It was a crazy argument. But don't worry, don't, it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> the point here is you map things to the identical representation. So what happens in trips? Okay, so here's our phosphorylated b rap the suspense part. Um, so you've got the phosphorylation, the agent, and the effective. Okay, and if we look at the passive, um, we basically get the same representation. Uh, oh, exactly, but there would be a, a passive feature on this. So just be added on. I thought it, I had it on the slide, but I don't. Um, as we get to the nominalizations, the phosphorylation of ERK by BRAF, um, what's changed? Well, first, the quantifiers change. This is now a definite reference rather than the event. And the second one is the speech track became an ident identify rather than a, uh, a tell. It's not making a, this is not making an assertion. Okay, this is referring to an event. Okay, um, so. The semantic structure of the event is identical, okay? but the function of this in language and context is really different. This is referring to a previous event that we talked about, or something that's you know so obvious that, it, that it's there. But um, whereas the other one was just making a new statement. Um, so essentially, we taught the semantic structure, but we also keep the distinction. And then uh, what was the other one? The other one was ERKS BRAF phosphorylation. Uh, we actually, a parser currently outputs bare there. I think that's actually a bug. It should probably, this should be a definite reference. Maybe not, I don't know. What do you think? This, uh, I mean, it's not referring. In your mind, I don't know. It's a... Which of the... Uh, this is the green one here. The green one. Right, right. I, I, I think you know with bear corresponds to something more like a generic or a kind or something like that. Um, but it, I think it's a little, it'll a little bit. It might be used either way. But I guess the point again is um, essentially the parser is cr creating exactly the same uh, s s some structures like AMR is, although it is keeping the distinctions as well because those are important for um, <clears throat> further analysis. Okay, so here's an interesting example. <clears throat> every person, again from the manual, every person failed to eat. Um, so we have both, both, both these cases, we have a uh, person and the eating event. Um, but in the AMR, by uh, a process, I'm not sure what it is, um, they have decided that we can drop the fail. And so we end up, I think they're encoding the entailment, which is every person didn't eat. Okay? It's, a, it's exactly the same uh, representation as every person didn't eat. Um, whereas in trips, again, based on the principle that we're compositionally building the semantics based on what the words were, um, we have this event failing event. And I think that is important for interpreting the sentence in. Uh, in context again, the fact that it failed uh, to eat means they tried to eat it. Um, whereas every person didn't eat doesn't have that entailment. So um, I think this is a mistake uh, uh, in trying to do the, I don't know. Uh, the only way I think you could get consistent annotation like this from this is you have a specific set of verbs saying handle all these specially and that seems very unmotivated. So, um, 
Uh, so that's a, that's a, a puzzle, but uh, that's what they're doing. And then quantification. Uh, we've sort of already seen this in some of the examples, but here's a uh, here's a uh, AMR representation, and this representation is true is the representation of any one of these sentences. Okay, a boy wants to go, the boy wants to go, boys want to go, and the boys want to go. There's no distinction made in AMR on this. Um, whereas clearly, if we're trying to interpret and understand language in, in context here. This is, is critical information whether you're talking about an individual boy or many boys and whether it's we're referring to ones you've already talked about before or there are new ones coming in. Um, so it's critical information. And uh, basically, um, it's trapped in the logical form just by these uh, different quantifiers. Here's the singular indefinite, the singular definite, the indefinite set, and the definite set. Um, so again, we're capturing that information there that um, is critical for further subsequent interpretation, and that is uh, missing. Um, and there's a bunch of other um, quantifiers. Pronouns, implicit pronouns, which are sort of elided arguments, they basically are referring to something. It's implicitly re there, but we, we didn't mention it, and we didn't put a pronoun in there either. Um, uh, various different explicit quantifiers like all, each, every, uh, quantity terms, WH terms for questions, kinds. Um, okay, so the next big difference, semantic, semantic roles. The roles are defined by the explicit predicate. So if you want to know what the roles are for uh, the boy wants to go, you have to look in the definition of want under sense 101 and uh, look up what the roles are and what they mean and what to do. Um, now, there is some generality in there. Even ARB0 is almost always a, a, a causal role, something like an agent. Um, ARB21 is often, is typically the a patient role or affected role. Um, so those have some regularity, but that is in some sense, coincidence. It's, it's not part of the formalism. Um, and all the other roles are completely idiosyncratic, as we'll see in, in a second. Um, um, the trips roles are defined independently of the predicate uh, in terms of existence, causality, and time. Uh, and so here are the core roles um, that basically break things out by causality and uh, and existence, really. So we have an agent role, which is probably the role that everybody can agree on in semantic role labor. The only role that everybody can agree on is some after they, not They don't even quite agree, but for the most part, mostly agree. Um, there's then a kind of typical kind of patient or what we call the effective role. And these, this is basically our entities that are changed as part of the event. So the event is um, an inherent part of the meaning of the event is this object undergoes change. Um, the neutral is neither causal nor changed, but is an object that uh, can come in and out of existence. Um, which are most things, because abstract, you know, stories come in and out of existence, uh, um, beliefs, uh, you basically, um, so it's a large class, but they're basically, so they fell in this role here, and there's some examples here. Then the final role is the non-causal, non changed and non-existent, these are objects that don't exist um, uh, in any world there, but they're, they're essentially, these are things that are kind of essentially propositional. So we have, you know, this, he believes that the money's gone. This is a proposition that's being believed. Um, I want to go, this is an event, uh, whatever, uh, type, um, that is uh, the theme of the one thing. Uh, properties being crazy. So crazy is uh, is a is a property of the world. It doesn't come into existence or not. Um, being crazy comes into existence, but crazy by itself doesn't. Um, and scale. Why he weighs five pounds. Um, so those are uh, basically the four key roles. Um, the rest of them are all essentially we view as uh, prepositional adverbial meanings. 
Um, so these are the relational roles. And there's key ones like result, essentially relates an event to its culminating state. Location locates an event. Uh, method describes how an event's going on. There's a bunch of these, and there's some more um, that I didn't, couldn't fit on the slide, but um, there's a, maybe uh, uh, 10 or 15 of these um, that we have. So here's just an example of the, the use of relational roles. The mouse run under, ran under the table, run, ran under the table. Um, this is actually ambiguous, uh, right? It might be that the mouse ran and quickly scurried under the table because the cat was chasing it. Or it might be that it's just under the table running around in circles, OK? Um, in both cases, the meaning of run here and the verb in this construction and the meaning of under the table are identical. The only difference is the semantic role between them. And so here, the mouse ended up under the table is the result. And here, the mouse was under the table uh, when running is the location. So what these relational roles, these relational roles do is essentially identify the causal temporal relationship between these two independent propositions. Okay? So we have something being under the table, and we have something running. In this case, this is under the table immediately after this running stops, so it's a culmination. In this case, uh, this is under the table during a whole, you know, during the whole time that the running is going on. Um, so the, the roles kind of capture that uh, meaning. Uh, in, in many representations, that we might encode this as saying that things like under might be ambiguous, and you might have two senses. One is you know, where something ends up, and the other is where it is, um, or, uh, or various other uh, um, <clears throat> uh, things. But we don't need that here. We have one sense of being under, and it... Uh, um, goes through. <clears throat> okay, so that was roles. Moving quickly through. Um, sense tags. We already talked about it. Here's another example uh, from, but indeed his planet is too small. I think this is from the little prince or something like that. <laughs> um, and we see again, we have uh, We have a, a note, we basically have, uh, actually you can't even tell, this should, this, you can't, you can't tell. But basically, these are just the words. Um, I guess the B, the B verb is, is gone. Um, in the trip logical form, you'd actually have the B verb there relating uh, the planet to being too small. Oh, I guess I have that. Okay. Uh, so here's indeed the planet, is, this planet is too small. Here's the B verb, what does it relate? It relates a planet, which is uh, some sort of geo geological or ge geoformation object. Um, and it relates that to a property, which is a formal role, which is being small, um, which is a size scale, it's kind of medium intensity. Uh, and there's a degree modifier on it, which is two. And in fact, the whole, um, claim is modified by this degree of belief is what indeed I'm not sure that's really the uh, we probably could do a better semantics than that but that's where it places it right now and, um, and, uh, and so you see several different things again we're trying to faithfully capture the structure of the, the sentence how the sentence was composed um, and also we're uh, trying to tag the senses. So they do do sense disambiguation for events, um, for verbs. Um, but one of the critical things uh, for us is that we should be supporting some sort of entailment on it. And, uh, and that's really not part of what AMR is doing because it's not part of PropBank. Um, and so we have three quite related verbs here, constrict, compress, and squeeze. Um, each one has a wholly independent ent entry, okay? Um, so we have no idea that these things are related to each other. Uh, and if you look at the argument structures, each one is completely is different. Um, uh, I guess they all have an agent. Um, but beyond that, we, we, we get into... Uh, um, 
all sorts of different things. And so, for instance, we have, uh, there's an extent amount narrow by and start point and end point you can do for, for uh, constrict. So he constricted it three inches would be some sort of extent. Or he constricted it uh, from, I don't know, what are you constricting? From 10 inches to five inches or something. Um, those would be, uh, though, those are explicitly pulled out here. Um, but you could have said the same thing for compress, and those rules aren't here. Um, uh, so, and this is in fact R2, in, where this is the extent of something compressed. R2 here is what it's compressed into it. So he compressed it into uh, a ball, All right? You made a ball out of it. Um, that's, a, that's a fine construction there. Um, but you can also compress something six inches or whatever like there, or you know, from or to, or you can actually constrict something into a ball over here. So all of these, I would claim, share the same set of roles. They're all the same things you can do with these kind of verbs. Um, but in prop bank, you get no relationship between them, and in fact, you know, like what R2 is, well, you have, you have to look at the verb and look at its definition. It's, there's no independent definition. Um, so, that's sort of the state of that. So, given this, it really doesn't... It means that if you're going to start trying to do inference um, from this, you're not, uh, you haven't got a good place to start. You don't know how the, even these very semantically related verbs are. Um, are related. In trips, um, it's everything's organized, all the senses are organized into an ontology. All of these verbs here are all part of a more general class, which is called decrease. And I let's just fill in the rest of the ontology. This is the ontology going up. It uh, goes up higher, but this is the most interesting stuff. So decrease is an instance of changing magnitude, which is a changing of adjusting, uh, which is a transformation, which is a change, which is an event causation. And each one of these types add a little bit more to the meaning. Um, all I've shown here is where the roles come in. So we have essentially events of causation always have an agent and affected role. Uh, events of transformation can have added result role. So you transform something into something. Uh, adjusting also has an extent role. So you adjust something by a certain amount. Um, and all of these get inherited down. So we're rather halfway down to decrease. We have at least these four roles. So we know kind of the constructs that verbs related to decreasing um, can be involved in. Yeah? What happens when the word means I'm saying in terms of the system, for example, like Yes, right. And, and, and how, how is this? Um, sometimes, depending on what it is, it, it depends on whether you. Uh, you might have multiple senses for for the for the verb um, that if you if they really do seem to be describing different things. Otherwise, you um, you have a different result that you cleave. In uh, I forget what your example was. You cleave. Yeah. I mean, if you can, when you cleave to somebody, you can be embracing them. Oh, I don't know that sense. Okay, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, all right, yeah. Well, then they probably would be different senses because the only cleave I knew was kind of cutting a thing in half, cutting something off, but. Uh, Right, so those would be different senses. Um, and in fact, if you look at the event hierarchy going down, then you see that the top of the event hierarchy is organized into all the different classes of events. Um, so we have events of change, which you just saw. There's events of action here, uh, events of causation, uh, motion acquired, lots of things under here. This is just a sampling. And over here, we've got events of state, things like possession and having problems. Um, and the ontology and the set of roles are all, um, you get the roles from the ontology, basically. That's where the roles live. Um, so, um, so, so the TRIPS logical form is, is tightly integrated into our ontology of the world, and so it is enabling inference. Um, and so how do we put all that together? This is one slide. Actually, I might have showed this a couple of weeks ago, but... This is basically uh, the parser, uh, the whole system, how we use all this stuff. Um, uh, basically, there is a, a 
hand-built grammar. It's basically uh, an HPST-inspired grammar with the kind of ways they deal with movement and, and features moving up and down the hierarchy. Um, there's uh, the lexicon, which actually combines um, both an ontology type, which we just looked at, managing, and a template, which tells us how to map syntax to the role. So agent affected is a really simple template that says transitive, it's a transitive verb where the subject is agent, the object is affected. And the ontology brings in selection of restrictions and preferences on arguments. Um, so if you're eating something, most likely what you're eating is uh, food or something edible, um, stuff like that. And in fact, uh, so all of the so the ontology that we're using for reasoning, the lexicon, um, and, the, and the parsing are all combined in here to actually uh, generate a logical form. Is there, is there yeah. a method to update the ontology and templates? Yes. Yes. In fact, we've been doing a lot of work on, on uh, being able to automatically extend the ontology and automatically derive new uh, lexical meanings. And what sure I'm going to actually do in just a second. Um, so the advantages of having all this structure here is it does, exactly as you just said. It allows us to start automatically expanding uh, <laughs> things without, uh, you know, having to hand code more stuff. Um, so uh, we, can, uh, we can, and I won't talk about this today, but we've been doing a lot of work on just being able to read and then build uh, new definitions of words and, and, and axioms based on that. Um, and. Uh, and, and I've got a couple of examples here. So here's one example, which is how we deal with um, new words. So trips is a broad coverage parser, so it'll parse arbitrary, parse it in arbitrary text to give it. Um, the re and it's not that we went in and hand-built all the lexical entries. In fact, we have built about 7,000 uh, words, definitions of words by hand. Um, well, uh, but there are, you know, at least 100,000 words in English. So what do you do about the other 92,000? Well, this is what we do. We basically take advantage of the structure we have. So here's example, here's attenuate. It's a verb. We don't know what it means. Um, we go to WordNet, which has like 150,000 words of English, um, although only about 100,000 that aren't proper names or so. Um, <clears throat> and we see that it has two senses. And we can move up the hypernym hierarchy, um, and we get uh, um, you know, moving up a kind of levels of abstraction uh, in WordNet until we essentially find a mapping uh, into the trips ontology. So the trips ontology is only about 2,000 concepts, but each one of them uh, we've identified what concepts in WordNet it, it, it associates with. And usually there's multiple ones. Usually, like, there might be. I don't know what an average, three or four are probably word net senses to each. Um, sometimes a lot more. Um, so then we have two ontology types for what the meaning of this might be. Um, the question is, what does its syntax look like? So what we do is we look at all the words that are in these types. Um, so we see under modify, we know what alter, how alter behaves, we know how modify behaves, we know how modulate behaves. And mm -hmm. over on decrease, we know how compress, constrict, decrease. Um, those ones behave, and each one of them has one of these templates that describes how the syntax relates to the semantic roles defined on your code. Okay, so then we just build, we just take this union all together and say, well, these are all the lexical entries for it anyway, right? It might be modified with a couple of different templates, it might be decreased with a few more templates. Now, this is almost surely, actually surprisingly, uh, as we've cleaned up the ontology, it's, it's become less and less of a case, but it's, it's, this could clearly over-generate, and you might generate all sorts of lexical entries that just can't happen for this particular verb. Um, but that's okay, because if it can't happen with this verb, you're not going to see it. And so we added something into the lexicon here, but it never happens. And in fact, we could keep track of what happens and throw out the things that don't happen as we go along. We haven't done that yet. Um, in fact, we don't even keep it right now. We just generate this on the fly at every time we need it. Um, and so we have um, you know, all these basic patterns for attenuates now. We can actually produce a semantic parse for. 
the Y attenuate. So we know that attenuate is one of these verbs where, uh, what are they called? Where you can, uh, where the subject, you can do it in an intransitive form where it's the affected object that's undergoing the transformation, or it has, uh, um, uh, or a causal interpretation. Causal and causal. Yeah, right, in or something like that, right. So we've, we've figured out that this, these are various different patterns that, uh, um, that attenuate can have. And they're just in the parser, and we can parse it with uh, attenuate. And that's how, in fact, in the biology project uh, that I talked about last time, that's how we're getting coverage of the biology data. Um, we have to do more than WordNet in that one. That one, we have to do the same thing but looking up in these large bio-ontologies and pulling in, you know, but most of them are proper names, you know, names of proteins and stuff like that, and they don't have, they don't have very complex syntax. So, um, but essentially, that's a strategy. We have to pull in um, from other resources, but because of the systematic way that we've uh, developed this, um, this works. It works great. In fact, most of the time, we don't and that we don't bother to add new uh, verbs to the lexicon now because the system's going to do a good job automatically deriving the lexicon for the entry when we need it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, so how well does this work? Well, in fact, uh, we haven't uh, done, we did an evaluation in 2008. And at that stage, we developed an evaluation metric which essentially was reinvented as S, S match a couple of years ago. Um, but it's basically, uh, based on, you have a gold standard logical form, you have a, um, what the parser produced, and what you do is you essentially find an alignment between the nodes that maximizes your score. Um, where, so you get, uh, um, so we might have this alignment, and then you can then go through and match and say, how, how many nodes match, how many semantic relations match, and add them all up. Um, run them through some formulas and you can calculate precision and recall and, and other things like that. Um, so in this case, we would see that with this alignment, which is the optimal alignment, where we got sandwich right here, we got the wrong sense of eat. You know, there's eat one here, we got eat two. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's various errors in this alignment and, and sometimes we get the wrong roles right here. It looks like we got, we got an object role and this is an ob role. And so you can go through and just look at all the different uh, ways. And so, so the key idea is you, you basically, you know, you've got to find the alignment that maximizes the score. How do you weigh the relative, um, how do you assign relative weights to different kinds of errors? Like if there's a, let's say, a thematic role error versus a, Verb sense error. Yeah, well, right now we're, we're, uh, we're, it's very crude, this one, this was. Basically, it's either an exact match or uh, or almost nothing. As you can see on the edges, if we don't get the right label, you get zero. Um, on nodes, um, uh, we've got node types and senses, and you can get, so you might get, you know it's an event, but you don't get the right sense or vice versa or whatever, so you get a little bit of, so, but basically it was just a, a preliminary um, you could do all sorts of more sophisticated matching. Like you might be that you've got you've got a sense of a verb that's kind of a subset of you've got two abstract sense, but it actually includes the right, right one. Right. And so you could actually <laughs> do various different scoring on that. Um, we we haven't uh, done that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so I don't know, like what this is match? Is it mm -hmm. like an existing benchmark that like that's what they has... use in the, uh, AMR? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. And that's the that's the evaluation metric okay. for how well a parser is doing. Um, so, but then, since they don't include quantifiers, for instance, they don't score um, them, and they don't, and they're not, so, not, not got word senses on the noun, so they don't score those. I mean, you yeah. just, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, this was an evaluation in two thousand eight, um, and you know, we built gold standards. There's a sample paragraph that was kind of thing, and we parsed stuff we'd never seen before, it, which other teams uh, selected. So we we didn't even select the paragraphs ourselves. Um, and, uh, whoops, backwards. And this is what the parcel was doing then in, in that, those days. Um, so we we're about, uh, about an 81% F score on, on the parcel. Um, we actually, this is, it's a lot of work and actually we're much more interested in whole sentence accuracy and whether it supports the applications rather than, than these, uh, these things. So we haven't really redone this since, but, uh, for sure, our numbers have gone up 
uh, significantly from that. Um, so it works relatively well. Um, And in fact, our major source of errors were word sense ambiguity. Uh, word sense ambiguity. Mm. So, calling to a close. Just kind of, um, you know, what we're doing is sort of out of the norm for uh, um, uh, these days, um, where for the most part, um, uh, people don't hand engineer systems, right? So we hand built this lexicon, the grammar. And the ontology, um, and uh, that has been a huge effort. Um, and then we do a little, little bit of tuning at the end, um, and uh, in order to get the system running. Um, the AMR approach, which is and which is the, uh, the the common standard approach in NLP these days, is you put your effort into building the corpus. And then you use that to then machine learning to learn parsing systems. Um, so these are quite different approaches, and uh, and in fact the the level of effort I didn't mean, I meant by here these are proportion of, of something rather than actually amount of effort. I actually believe they're going to have to put much more uh, effort into building this corpus than we've ever put into building the trip system. Um, uh, it's a massive effort. It takes, uh, I don't know, it, it, it takes a significant time to do one sentence. So you need a large number of annotators, and they're going to have to do this over years. Um, uh, so the real question is, well, which is more effort? I don't know. As I said, I, I think actually probably uh, hand engineering is less, less effort. Um, but, uh, but there are benefits to doing that. There are real less benefits to doing the other as well. Um, better coverage and accuracy. I, it actually, if I think about it, um, I, it, it, I can't even begin to estimate how much data um, they will have to hand annotate them before you can get a high performance parser out of it. Um, especially because there's no systematic relationship between uh, the, you know, the predicates and, and other things like that. Um, that's going to be an empirical issue, obviously. Um, but, uh, um, oops. Oh well, they're probably going to send it out automated, I suppose. Maybe they're doing it. Yeah, at some stage, I imagine, yeah. Generate something that's right. intended to be approximate and then right. fix it. Or um, like uh, one of the things we're really interested in is how you can quickly optimize things to new domains, because you know we want to build you know a new dialogue system in a new domain. Um, uh, and so we we want to wrap, we just want to reuse what we have, and so we want to rapidly customize it. Um, I think that's quite easy on the hand engineering thing. You just do a little bit of more engineering um, uh, to adjust things or to you know fix things that don't work or whatever like that. Um, it's much harder if you're doing corpus and, and machine learning because it would mean you have to build a new corpus for the new domain. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a big advantage of hand engineering. Um, the big advantage of uh, uh, doing the corpus is it's, uh, it really stimulates huge amounts of work in the field, because that's now a common resource. And as you see already, there are a bunch of different teams in various different places trying to build AMR parsers, because the data's there. Um, and so in some sense, um, you know, AMR is going to have a uh, sort of a much bigger impact on the field. Than than than, uh, than trips ever will. Um, um, but the real kind of unless you can make inferences that they can't. Well, no, I, but we can. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, for individual projects, right? If you really want to make something work in a specific application that is integrated into some significant reasoning in the back, um, then you know, um, uh, they're not even considering that. Right? So the goal, um, the goal for you know all the work on semantic parsing, AMR semantic parsing, is clearly well defined, right? You try and build a system that, that gets a better S match score on the corpus, and that's it. Um, so there's no thought beyond that on how does this get used in the system. Um, so I think that's the weakness of it. So it's, it's a big strength 
Um, because it's going to stimulate lots of work. We're going to learn lots of things. Um, and a big weakness, I think, in that it's not clear how uh, it's going to integrate into a backend system. <laughs> and that's, I, to me, getting philosophical for a minute. Uh, that's the big problem with natural language processing right now, is it's divorced from, uh, mostly divorced from knowledge representation and reasoning. And it's kind of, it's viewed as its own, you know, building, getting something that gets a, a good AMR parse or a good syntactic parse is viewed as an end in itself. Um, it doesn't matter what this stuff will be used for later. Um, so it's, that's, the, I think, the weakness. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, they, you know it's, it's important, I think, to do, do, do pursue all of them. Um, so finally, what would I like an AMR 2.0? And I heard a rumor that they're actually <laughs> defining it. I don't know. Do you know? Ah, oh, I heard a rumor they are. Okay, so here's my top four things. Uh, the first one I think is easy. Record the quantifiers. Okay, there's already, you know, we, we already understand a lot about quantifiers. It would be trivial to put it in there, uh, trivial to annotate for a human. Um, I can't, it's beyond me why they chose not to do it uh, in the first one. It didn't, it, it was just no complexity. And in fact, you know, unless you do this, AMR is not going to be useful for, uh, you know, getting integrated into subsequent systems. Um, not very useful. Um, I guess the, the thought is, I think most of this came out of people interested in machine translation. And I think maybe the argument was, well, you know, quantifiers trans already translate sort of independently from language to language. So we don't really need to worry about that. What we really need to worry about is, you know, semantics and senses. Um, so maybe from a machine translation uh, perspective, it's not important. I don't know. Um, uh, word senses. Um, you know, if we're really going to use this stuff for reasoning, we're going to have to get uh, senses for the words, and we need the ontologies for it, and we need to be able to do reasoning on it. Um, so not right now, they're basically doing verbs and normalized verbs, um, and using the fixed set of prop bank. If you hit a verb that is not in prop bank, uh, you basically have to define a new entry for prop, essentially a, a new entry in prop bank before you can really, uh, before it becomes sort of part of something you can do. So basically, you know, all new words have to be manually added. Integration with an ontology. Now, it's interesting because the prop bank, you know, was worked on and turned into onto notes, which I actually believe AMR is more using. Actually, maybe you are probably know on it. Are they really using onto notes or a prop bank? You know, so they have a, another the sense pool is like a, another version of onto notes. So they added like so they started from onto notes and, and expanded it, yeah, okay. like rather them. than prop bank. Yeah, right. Because from prop bank to onto notes, they actually collapsed a bunch of stuff and made it much more systematic. Um, and then they're, they're kind of expanding out from onto notes. The interesting thing is onto notes actually does have a link to the Omega ontology, um, although we have not been able to find uh, uh, what that link is anywhere, and nobody's been able to give us that data. Um, and uh, and all, but but even if it did, um, the key thing for us about the ontology is it also links in the semantic roles and all the other stuff, and that's. You know, they might be able to get a type hierarchy that links these things, but it wouldn't affect the linguistic structures, I think. Um, so this is a tough one, right? The first one's easy. The next two are really difficult. What's my, I forget what my fourth one is. <laughs> Systematic semantic roles. Yeah, I, 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 I really think the uh, prop bank, you know, defining roles into the idiosyncratically for uh, each verb sense is a bad idea that's going to inhibit uh, a lot of interesting work in the future. Um, and uh, and I don't know why they did it. They're already, you know, you could have worked from the verb net role set or whatever. There are existing role, role sets out there. Um, of course, they all have some problems here or there, but, but at least they're re reasonably systematic. Um, uh, so I think that's, that's my, so the first one's easy. The fourth one is relatively easy, I would say. Um, and the other two are challenges. Um, so maybe yeah, we need to wait till AMR 3.0 for some of it. Um, well, the fourth one, I mean, there's so much uh, controversy in the semantic world. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and, uh, but I, I think, think they just 
couldn't find any basis for agreement in the hierarchic semantic world. Yeah, right, right. There's ones with hundreds, <laughs> yeah, some right. with five. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, <laughs> but, I, but I, my claim is it doesn't not so much matter. As long as you have a systematic approach, then you'll get the general generalities across verb classes and other stuff. But like they'll still have to agree. <laughs> oh, you mean they they have to agree? Someone, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. If this AMR was designed by a team of like twenty different researchers, so yeah, you're probably right. Nobody could agree on what the roles are, so we said, all right, we're gonna we're just gonna use proper rank roles. Yeah, no, it could be. Yeah, um, that's true. So yeah, what it needs then is is someone to just take it over and say, screw this, I'm going to decide what the roles are, and here they are, <laughs> and once you build the corpus, everyone will use it. Well, that's right, you would have to actually, well, I think, you know, there, as soon as they release a new thing version, they're going to have to go through and, and redo the annotation. Presumably it'll be much faster, like adding a quantification, I can imagine you could all, almost do that automatically, um, given you, if you have the, still have the sentences and the uh, annotations, I think you could almost automate it on what, what the quantifiers are. Yeah, you Right. Now, you can do, you know, like for instance, arg, arg zero can go to agent, almost, and that's almost an infallible loop, almost. Um, and, but then as soon as you move down the numbers, it gets less and less. Now, some of the roles do have, uh, for instance, they do have modifiers on them. Just on that, uh, if we go right back. So there is a there is a wedge into getting something more systematic. Come on. Yeah. Notice that these are modifiers on it. So this says R2 has got this extent label on it. Okay, it's telling you that this is an extent. Now that's what's called the extent role in, in, in trips. Um, uh, you know, we have uh, something that's sort of a goal here. Um, I don't know what dire stands for, but Direction, the starting point is direction. I don't know if you sound right, but, um, uh, but in general, right, they, they are already kind of sort of attaching the semantics to it, um, which could be so it might be that they could, you know, at least start off a, a, a systematic conversion into uh, a roles. So, like, you just pull all the extent things in, and now that becomes extent, and you say that's an extent role. Um, and uh, and the patient is, uh, um, you know, I think PPT -P 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 stands for something like patient, is that right? I'm guessing. But these are both cases of being a uh, patient role, uh, uh, a patient life role. <laughs> um, they're not systematic. Even verb nets, not. I'm in trouble. I actually, five years ago, I decided, oh, you know, I'm tired of doing my own roles. And uh, I said, I'm just going to use VerbNet. And I started doing that, and it drove me crazy. <laughs> There's so many inconsistencies in there. Uh, and then that sort of then I said, OK, I'm going to come up with a consistent set of roles um, and, uh, and just go with that. Um, I also looked a lot at uh, the other uh, really kind of systematic approach uh, that was done was by uh, um, called Lyrics. Um, and uh, it was Harry Bunt, I guess. Is it Harry Bunt? I forget. But anyway, I bet you none of you know there's an ISO standard for semantic roles. They did it in Europe, and it's, and it's approved. Um, <laughs> so we should be using it. And that's the lyric scheme, which actually has some interesting things in it. Um, but even so, it, uh, um, and so I also thought of using lyrics and tried that for a while. It didn't drive me quite as crazy. Um, but it also didn't, there was a lot of decisions that were made that uh, just didn't seem to be related to uh, entailment, what kind of entailment you get, get out of it. So, so we ended up with our new, yet another role set. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, well. Boy, I would love if there's anyone that could tell me how to get rid of this problem. This is a, uh, uh, I guess IBM's got a speaker series going on, and they they set up this. Uh, you can see it over here. They set up.